Welcome to The Bo Show. You probably remember the story of Jussie Smollett, a not very well-known actor from the show Empire. What put him on the map was not his acting roles, but rather the claim that he was beaten up by two Trump supporters in freezing temperatures in the wee hours of the morning in the upscale neighborhood of Streeterville in Chicago while he tried to get a Subway sandwich. Smollett claimed he was the victim of this alleged homophobic and racist hate crime in 2019, just as everything was getting geared up for the election at a time of peak racial tensions, and especially with accusations regarding Donald Trump. In February of 2019, Smollett was charged with felony disorderly conduct for making a false report to Chicago police. Police originally investigated it as a hate crime, but could find no video evidence of the allegation. And then, when police spoke with brothers Ola and Abel Osandero, it was revealed that Smollett had paid them to stage this hate crime. According to former Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson, Smollett paid the brothers $3,500 to stage this crime to help promote his career. It was these brothers who purchased the brand new rope that was placed around Smollett's neck that was pivotal in understanding that this hate crime was a hoax. The lawyer for the Osandero brothers says that they are apparently deeply remorseful for their involvement in this, realizing what this does to the actual victims of hate crimes and minorities. You know who isn't remorseful at all? Jesse Smollett. A grand jury indicted Smollett in March of 2019, but all charges were suddenly unexpectedly dropped just weeks later, sparking justifiable outrage. But the case was then revived with a special prosecutor, and Smollett was recharged with the 16 felony disorderly conduct counts. At the time that the charges were unexpectedly dropped, his lawyer, Patricia Holmes, doubled down on the fake hate crime, calling Smollett a real victim and blaming the Chicago police for bowing to the jury of public opinion. Holmes is a black attorney who has been a defense lawyer for white collar crimes, including wire fraud. She is from the south side of Chicago, so you would think that this woman would understand the plight of her race and true fraud, but she defended a liar. I realize every defendant deserves due process and a trial by jury, but considering that Holmes is a minority and a female, you would think she would be less likely to take on a case of a fake hate crime, considering what that does to all legitimate victims. When the prosecution unexpectedly dropped the charges, they did so without even discussing it with Chicago police, which was a punch in the gut to them. Kimberly Fox was the Cook County prosecutor, and she recused herself early on in the case due to potential impartiality based upon familiarity with potential witnesses. Fox would be key in these charges getting dropped, which they say was justice, considering that Smollett had already completed community service. But that's not justice at all. What a waste of resources by the Chicago police who have to deal with unprecedented murders in that city. Mark Garagos also was an attorney for Smollett at the time, who represented murderer Scott Peterson. Producers of Empire cut Smollett's role from the show to avoid what they called disruption, but 20th Century Fox and Fox Entertainment, the studio behind Empire, said that they were gratified that all charges against Smollett had been dropped. Why? Why would they be so gratified? What is gratifying about employing an actor that would fake a hate crime that would cause national outrage, enrage racial tensions, and abuse city, state, and police resources. What is gratifying about that? Smollett at the time also hired Sunshine Sachs, a PR firm that also represented Harvey Weinstein. Well, isn't that special? Sunshine Sachs' head of strategy is named Chris Bastardi. Hmm, Bastardi. I'm not making this up. He immediately claimed Smollett was a victim. I'm guessing that Jesse is still looking for his attackers, just like OJ is still looking for his wife's murder. Trying to create his best acting role yet, Smollett went on Robin Roberts' show for a sit-down interview. Take a look at this Oscar-worthy masterpiece. I'm pissed off. What is it that has you so angry? Is it the 
the attackers? It's the is attackers, it? but it's also the attacks. It's like, you know, at first it was a thing of like, listen, if I tell the truth, then that's it, because it's the truth. Mm -hmm. Then it became a thing of like, oh, how can you doubt that? Like, how do you, how do you not believe that? It's the truth. And then it became a thing of like, oh, it's not necessarily that you don't believe that this is the truth. You don't even want to see the truth. Robin Roberts is a gay black woman, but she's also a journalist. She claims that she saw red flags in this interview, but never pushed back because she claims those in her community would say that she didn't believe him. Well, frankly, it's not her job to believe him or to not believe him. It's to get to the truth. Roberts was aware of comments Smollett had made at an L.A. concert venue not long after the attack. I was bruised, but my ribs were not cracked. Okay. They were not broken. Okay. <laughs> I went to the doctor immediately. Frank Gatson drove me. I was not hospitalized. Okay. Both my doctors in L.A. and Chicago cleared me to perform, but said to take care, obviously. Look at how he has to reference his own cheat sheet to get his story straight. Robin Roberts is both gay and black, and so is Smollett. Is it any wonder that he picked her to interview him? If she prides herself in being fair, well, she wasn't. And she should have passed the interview on to someone that was more unbiased or someone who could conduct the interview without worrying about the blowback. But this is such an example of confirmation bias. So many people thought Jesse was telling the truth both in the black community and the gay community. They wanted it to be true. They thought it to be right in line with what MAGA hat wearing Trump supporters would do. But in sub-zero temperatures in the middle of the night in one of Chicago's most liberal gay neighborhoods, that's suspicious. But no one felt that they could question it. And that's exactly the problem. But let's go back to Cook County attorney Kim Fox just for a moment. She claims she recused herself due to a rumor that she was related to Smollett. In Special Prosecutor Dan Webb's review of how Fox handled the case, he didn't mince words, saying that there were, quote, substantial abuses of discretion and operational failures and of making false and or misleading statements to the public, unquote. That's pretty damning. It was thought that Fox was persuaded by Smollett's team and status currying favor with her, and while we don't know exactly what happened, her terrible miscalculations and even the perception that she could be swayed to drop charges in such a horrific hoax made her seem impotent and corrupt, which is sadly par for the course in Chicago politics. Furthermore, Webb was never able to see all of the evidence on Fox's errors because it includes sealed grand jury evidence on Smollett that few ever saw. So Webb was only making his summary on limited knowledge, which seemed to be pretty clear about Fox. Former Chief of Staff to Michelle Obama, Tina Chen, made some calls to Fox in the days just after Smollett's staged attack, trying to get her to turn the case over to the FBI. This Chief of Staff is a family friend of Jesse Smollett. Chen claims she texted Kim Fox because the family was worried about how the case was being characterized. Now, wait a minute. Why does the characterization matter? If Smollett is lying, which he was, why have your high-profile Obama minions call in favors to the prosecuting attorney? Why not just investigate it? Why not ask for evidence? This was corrupt from the get-go, with an Obama aide stepping in for the family and texting Smollett's prosecutor and giving her number to a relative. Smollett was very cozy with the Obamas, I was on a TV panel in 2019 when all this was going on, and I was asked to give my opinion about it. I remember it vividly. Everyone just blindly believed Smollett. They thought that any questioning of him and his account was bigoted or racist or homophobic, and they just believed him outright, never mind the fact that he was in freezing temperatures in Chicago at 2 in the morning and claims that 2 White guys recognized him from the TV show Empire. No, they all thought he was telling the truth. So I did some digging, and I wanted to know more about this actor I had never heard of. So I was able to go back on Twitter and find some very, very interesting tweets. 
Here was a tweet I found from 2018, just one year before he staged the hate crime. I will skip over the expletives, but he says to Trump that he will continue to risk lives every time he breathes. Says Trump is a dumpster full of hate. Now what is ironic about this is that you can't even see what Smollett was responding to in Donald Trump because the reply was made to Trump's account, which has since been suspended. Smollett is directly inciting hatred when he himself is the one who risked lives by staging this hate crime. People will be less likely to believe legitimate hate crimes because of Jesse Smollett's actions. Smollett has called Trump 45 and all of his white hooded cohorts. It became clear to me that Smollett always hated Trump, even all the way back in 2016, calling him racist and misogynistic, as well as anyone who supports him. When you add this up, it looks like Smollett had it out for Trump. And I thought that this was important in the context of what happened. Yet no one wanted to bring up these tweets to get inside his psyche. He knew that racial tensions were at a fever pitch. He knew that he could get sympathy. He knew that most people in his community would believe him and maybe even some others. He knew that Trump and his supporters were accused of racism and bigotry. And so he staged a hate crime against himself, but which actually became a hate crime against, well, the president and his supporters. When you waste valuable city, state, and federal resources for a false claim, you have to be held accountable for that. Lee Daniels, the creator of the show Empire, put out an impassioned Instagram post when this fake incident first was reported. He said this, quote, no racist, F-U-C-K, can come in and do the things that they did to you. It's just another effing day in America. That post has since been deleted in light of the new revelations of the payoff of the Osandaro brothers. When you think of this rush to judgment and Hollywood's quickness to come to his defense and rip Trump supporters without a shred of evidence, we have to think about confirmation bias and the fact that Smollett preyed upon that. Smollett wanted a raise on Empire. Did he get it? No, not now, not ever. Thank God he didn't. So this is why the entire case is very important. And I always try to tie this into our current culture and environment. Jesse Smollett was a little known actor on a semi-popular show, but he is gay and he played a gay character. We have seen Hollywood get pushed to be more diverse. So in a way, Smollett had a hand in representing that diversity. Because he wanted a raise, so we think, he decided to stage a hate crime perpetrated by racist, homophobic Trump supporters. So he hired some guys to stage it, but they were sloppy. Receipts from the hardware store and personal checks show that Smollett orchestrated this whole thing. He did this at a time in 2019, just after the whole Covington Catholic High School standoff in DC, in which Trump supporter Nick Sandman, a young student, stood still while a Native American activist beat a drum in his face. The perception and media narrative was that Sandman was just another smug white racist MAGA kid. This narrative was false. Nick Sandman has made millions in defamation lawsuits over this. Then Jesse comes along and capitalizes on this racial tension and the notion that Trump supporters are trash. This story also proved to be false. But look at what happened around it. A Michelle Obama chief of staff steps in to help the family and the PR campaign around it. She texts prosecutor Kim Fox, who then has to step aside, but never really did. The chief of police sees that there is no evidence and now knows it to be a staged hate crime and a waste of his force. So what does Fox do? Fox tries to take it out of the police's hands and go to the FBI. Smollett hires Scott Peterson lawyer Mark Garagos and later a black female attorney who grew up in the south side of Chicago. He hires Sunshine Sachs, a PR firm who represented Harvey Weinstein and crafted his strategy. Every major Hollywood personality is rushing to judgment and to Jesse's aid. They're piling on. Jesse performs a concert with a small cut on his cheek and quotes from a script that he's written. He goes on Robin Roberts' show, a journalist who never pushes back on his claims because she feels hamstrung by her race and the gay community. As a result, she loses her journalistic credibility and fairness and ends up regretting that she did this interview. 
Smollett's tweets showed a pattern of hatred towards Trump and his supporters, which perhaps gave rise to his staging of this crime. But yet Trump is the one who got suspended. And Smollett's account and hate-based tweets still remain intact. All of this at a time when racial tensions were at a high and the election loomed. Kim Fox's office suddenly drops its charges against Smollett for no apparent reason and tries to expunge Smollett's record. But now a special prosecutor has recharged him. This speaks to so many elements of our society, including corruption, which is commonplace in Chicago, as well as confirmation bias, the idea that so many people wanted the hate crime to be true that they were willing to believe it without a shred of evidence. The same was true with the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearing. And now, thankfully, Smollett's last ditch effort to have his criminal case for lying to the police dismissed has been denied. Maybe there will be some form of justice in the end of this. But you sure don't see Hollywood or other media entities talking about it. It's like it was yesterday's news. But if we don't see the societal and cultural impact a case like this has, we may allow ourselves to repeat it. Look no further than my last episode where I talk about Dave Chappelle and how cancel culture is after him. Luckily, Netflix is not caving because maybe Chappelle is too big to fail. I don't know. A smaller comedian would surely be gone. If we truly want accountability, this case has to be tried. Community service is not the proper penance for lying about a hate crime which inflamed the national tension. And in the greater sense, wasn't the media responsible for this too? They had already been dead wrong in their reporting of the Nick Sandman Covington Catholic situation in DC. They were simply wrong and they willfully reported it inaccurately. And one month later, they jumped to this headline of a hate crime against a forgettable actor. They took the bait. They went for the sensationalism. They put themselves in the narrative. And Robin Roberts took the bait too. I mean, there you have Jesse Smollett saying to her that he's pissed off because it's the truth and some don't believe him. Why didn't Roberts ask him, well, Jesse, what evidence can you provide to, to quell the doubt? Where are the surveillance cameras? Why did you keep the mock noose on the whole way back? Why did you pass by the security guard at your building and, and say nothing? Why, do you, why did you still have a half-eaten Subway sandwich? Were you hoping that maybe you'd be their next spokesperson after pedophile Jared Fogle was arrested? Eat fresh. Journalists should be naturally inquisitive, if not cynical. But I just distinctly remember media figures looking at me like I was crazy for merely asking basic logical questions. This case and the Covington Catholic student case are what happens when people, especially the media, put on bias blinders. They chase the narrative rather than the facts. I think the morals of this horrific hoax are the following. One, let's assess every person's claim judiciously. They deserve an investigation. Let's let the police do their job. Two, let's hold representatives and attorneys accountable to be free from outside influence. Kim Fox blew this case. Gotta vote anyone out that is not playing by the rules. Three, let's not rush to judgment until facts are presented. Four, let's make sure the media also does not rush to judgment and pursues some desired narrative. Five, let's make sure phony staged hate crimes like this do not get swept under the rug. And six, let's make sure as a society we are not being unduly led to false conclusions. You know the one person in this that has expressed zero remorse, zero accountability, is Jesse Smollett himself. He hasn't been acting lately, which is good, but he owes everyone, especially this country, a sincere, long, heartfelt apology. He never gave one to the Chicago PD, and I'm not holding my breath for any other remorse from him, which reveals his sullied character. He's just upset that he got caught. Honestly, it's despicable. He needs to apologize to those who have been real victims because he's not the victim. In fact, he's the perpetrator. He's a felon. He's a liar. He's not what this country is all about. He's not a defender of freedom or a pursuer of the American dream. For all those who rushed to judgment and said, we can do better as a country, yes, we can. 
But that means that they need to look at themselves and their sacrificial lamb, Jesse Smollett. I'm Bo, and that's the show.